the universe has spoken to us and for the very, very first time we have been able to listen to it. For most of the days over the last 10, 15 years, I was waking up in the morning thinking, hmm, would today be the day that we actually see them for the first time? It took some time, but uh, at the 14th of September 2015, the advanced LIGO interferometers in the United States, designed to detect ripples in space-time, pick up the characteristic signatures of two black holes merging and, uh, and spiraling about a billion light years away from us. This was a very remarkable event uh, and this discovery made by about 1,000 scientists from the LIGO and Virgo collaborations was remarkable on several accounts. First of all, it was the first time we saw gravitational waves. It was the first time we could directly observe a uh, black hole and it was not a single black hole, but actually two black holes swirling around each other, dancing to a grand finale where they actually merged. This was the most powerful event ever observed by humans. The energy released in the last fraction of this violent dance was 50 times more powerful than what all the stars of the universe together radiate away. So quite a remarkable event. How do we know about all of this? What are gravitational waves? How can we detect them? Gravitational waves were actually predicted by Albert Einstein exactly 100 years ago as a consequence of his way to describe gravity in the theory of general relativity. They are ripples in space-time and you can compare them to what you see on a pond if you throw a stone in, you have these waves kind of rippling out. The interesting thing was that Einstein himself allegedly never believed we could see them. He really thought they were kind of an academic curiosity because they were so small. Actually, he got this small point wrong, uh, we now know, but probably he wouldn't mind about the thinking about all the marvelous, the fabulous possibilities that opens up for exploration of the universe. So what happens if a gravitational wave passes by? What happens to the Earth? What happens to you and me if such a gravitational wave goes through us? Actually, these gravitational waves stretch and squeeze space and stretch and squeeze you and me. So for one moment, we all get a little bit taller, but thinner, but at the moment later, periodically, we get a bit squashed and get a bit thicker, unfortunately. And this goes on and on all the time. The effect is fairly small. Actually, we all get just squeezed and squashed by about 10 to minus 22 meters. So just to put this number into relation, if you take one of your hairs and take a billionth of that, that's pretty small. But then you take another billionth of this small number, and that's 10 to minus 22 meters. So how can you actually measure something like this? What yardstick can you use for this? You can't use a normal yardstick or a tape measure because that would shrink and squeeze by the gravitational wave at the same time, so you wouldn't measure anything. But here comes Einstein again to help because in his special theory of relativity, he told us that while space and time are not constant, actually there's one thing that is constant and that is the speed of light. So what we can do to measure distances is we can measure the time it takes for light to travel from here and there and back. So this is what we do in gravitational wave detectors. We actually uh, send a light flash, one uh, going this direction, we split it up, the other going in this direction, let them reflect off mirrors at the end and let it come back to us or to me here. And depending on how the light arrives, if it arrives the same time back from both of these arms, I know uh, that the distance the light has traveled uh, is the same. If there's a small offset, then I know there's a difference in the arm length and therefore a gravitational wave has passed by. Um, so how do these interferometers look like? They're actually big L-shaped detectors, as I just tried to explain here. Um, why is that? First of all, if you do an L rather than just measuring one distance, you get a factor of two in signal. If you recall, I said it gets stretched in one direction and squashed in the other direction. That means you have the relative length between the two arms that change as a factor two. 
even more importantly, what you do is you do a relative measurement. And that's a good thing whenever you do measurements because uh, you get rid of all the kind of systematic errors you have in an absolute measurement which might affect both of your measurements, okay? Everything that is in both measurements will actually cancel out if you do such a relative measurement. The other thing we have to do is we have to make these interferometers like advanced LIGO really large. So uh, they're actually several kilometers long. Uh, in the case of advanced LIGO, they are four kilometers long, which makes the distance we have to measure a little bit larger. So it's not 10 to minus 22 meters, but 10 to minus 19 meters. This is still fairly small. And just to compare it again, it's measuring these four kilometers to a precision of about a thousandth of a proton diameter. So something fairly small. If you want to scale it up to better understand, it's measuring or it's equivalent to measuring the distance from here to the moon to less than one atom. Okay, so that's the precision you get. Question is, how can you do this? What kind of innovative concepts, what tricks do we need to play to achieve such a sensitivity? And here we have to talk about noise because whenever you want to do a precise measurement, at some point you run into noise because noise is all around us everywhere. So one of the noise sources we actually have to battle is seismic noise. While it feels to you and me standing here that the ground is fairly steady, it's actually not. There's quite a lot of seismic noise uh, from small earthquakes, trains passing by, actually the waves hitting the shoreline a few kilometers away. And all of these noise sources actually make the ground shake 10 billion times larger than what we would expect from a gravitational wave. So in order to get rid of this, we actually have to isolate our uh, interferometer mirrors from the ground motion, and that we do by uh, suspending them from pendulums. And that's more or less the same as what you have with the suspension in your car. Uh, with the suspension in your car, you get a smoother ride, and that's more or less the same what we do with our mirrors. They sit a bit more quiet. Unfortunately, doing just one pendulum is not enough, so we actually have to stack lots and lots of pendulums on top of each other to get to the required sensitivity. Another noise that is important for us is related to temperature, so-called thermal noise. Everything that has a temperature moves by Brownian motion, and that's the same for our mirrors, uh, the atoms and the molecules in the mirrors, and also in the suspensions. Again, this effect would be larger than our gravitational wave and wouldn't allow us to measure it if we wouldn't do any tricks. So the trick we apply here is using very pure, very special materials which have very little internal friction and a very high Q. And for example, the glass fibers from which the advanced LIGO mirrors are suspended are very special fibers developed here in the university 15 years ago. What else do we have? Another example of interesting noise is related to the flatness of the mirror. Obviously, if you send your light over far distances, you need to make your mirror very, very flat so that you can collect all the light back. So the mirrors we have, they're about 30 centimeters diameter. The flatness or the deviation of the flatness that we want to have is about a few atoms over these whole 30 centimeters. Again, that's a bit hard to imagine what it means, but it's fairly, uh, fairly flat. So if you want to compare it to something else, let's take the surface of the Earth. We know it's not very flat, but you know, if you sit on the space station and look down, it looks fairly smooth, the Earth. Uh, but obviously, we know there are things like Mariana Trench and uh, Mount Everest. If we would transfer the flatness of the mirrors we have to the surface of the Earth, then actually Mount Everest would be that high. Okay? That's the flatness uh, that we roughly get out of these mirrors. So you see, there are quite a few interesting concepts, I could only touch on a few here, that we have to employ in the gravitational wave detectors. So where do we want to go in future? How can we make our instruments even more sensitive? And there, we have to touch or overcome one noise source, which is actually intrinsic to the measurement process. What do I mean by that? It's more or less related to the Heisenberg uncertainty. If I want to measure, for example, assume I have a particle over here, and I want to know the distance from the particle to my eye. How do I measure this? I switch on a lamp, shine some light on this. The light particles get reflected off the particle, hit my eye, and I can say, oh yeah, I see it over there as a particle. The problem with that is that in the measurement process, I actually introduce noise, I change the position of the particle because when the light gets 
uh, reflected off the particle, it gives the particle a kick, and the, kick, uh, the particle changes the position. So exactly the same happens in our gravitational wave detectors, but not with small particles, but with our mirrors, which are 40 kilogram pieces of glass, okay? These are big things, you and I would have trouble lifting it and carrying it around, but actually the kicks of single photons push them around enough to spoil our measurements, okay? So this is a noise we have to overcome, this kind of back action noise, and one way of doing this uh, is a concept we explore here currently at the university in my group, it's called speed meters. How do these speed meters actually work? Instead of doing a single measurement of the distance by reflecting the light once off the mirrors, what we do is we actually let the light reflect twice off the, uh, off the mirror from opposite directions. By that, we still get some information about the, uh, about the mirror, not its position, but its speed, but from the speed you can calculate still uh, the gravitational wave signal, so we get that. But at the same time, what we have done by letting the light reflect twice from opposite directions, we cancel most of the noise originating from these kicks, most of the noise relevant in the measurement. And this technique, we are currently building the world's first prototype here in the labs just down the road, um, uh, has gone quite well so far. Um, and I'm happy to say that so far, uh, also to our own surprise, we haven't found any serious showstopper. So we are quite optimistic that maybe in 10 years we will not build any more Michelson interferometers as gravitational wave detectors, but these speed meters. Good, so that's what the future will look like. Where do we take this all? We are, with a recent discovery, just at the beginning of gravitational wave detection. You can compare it if you want for example, with the point when Galileo Galilei built the first telescope and looked at the night sky. Since then, obviously, we didn't stop, but we built uncountable versions of different types of telescopes to unveil the secrets of the universe. And exactly the same we want to do with gravitational wave detectors. Advanced LIGO, the instruments which we did the recent discovery, are not at their perfect sensitivity yet. Uh, we still have one or two years to improve them to get to that level, and that will help us to listen better to the sound of the universe. But we won't stop there. We have already the blueprints for upgrades to advanced LIGO in our drawers and hope to get these out in the next five, 10 years. Personally, my dream is to build uh, the Einstein telescope. This is a 30 kilometer uh, triangular gravitational wave detector or an observatory underground. So you go underground to get rid of all the noise uh, that we humans cause in the vicinity and so on. Uh, and this instrument will actually be able to listen to the universe uh, about a thousand times better than advanced LIGO. So what we have done in recent time is we have heard the very first note of the universe, of the cosmos, over the next few years, I think we will have the pleasure to listen to the full symphony of the universe. So, welcome uh, to a new era of astronomy. Thank you. Thank you.